our country has been debating this issue for too long. It's actually an issue that's tearing the country apart. Let's solve it. How much time do you have with any individual client? We talk to them on average around five minutes or so. Why do you think your message is getting through? I think it's because, you know, I looked at Scott Pruitt as a person, not as a devil. Just one day after a federal court approved AT&T's $85 billion takeover of Time Warner, Comcast is making a takeover bit of its own, offering $65 billion in cash for most of 21st Century Fox's film and TV businesses. The move sets up a bidding war with Disney, which already made an offer for Fox in December. A Saudi-led coalition is fighting to recapture Yemen's main port city, Hodeidah, with ground attacks and airstrikes, threatening a vital supply route for millions already close to starvation. The UN estimates that 70% of Yemeni's food, medicine, and fuel comes through the port. Antarctica's ice is melting three times faster than a decade ago, and it's accelerating, giving low-lying cities less time to prepare for a rise in sea levels. The study by 80 scientists in 14 countries found that more than 200 billion tons of ice is melting into the ocean each year. China's biggest rideshare company will pair passengers who carpool with drivers of the same sex in the early morning and late evening. It's the latest step Didi Chuxing has taken to win back customers' confidence after a 21-year-old female passenger was reportedly murdered by her driver last month. A joint bid by the US, Canada, and Mexico has won the right to host the 2026 World Cup, beating the only competing bid from Morocco. President Trump was pleased with the news, though he might not be so happy that his new best friend, North Korea, voted for Morocco. Up, up with liberation, down, down with deportation. Ever since the Trump administration announced an end to the DACA program last year, Republicans have disagreed about whether or how to protect the 700,000 Dreamers from being deported, and how much border security funding to demand in return. Because they couldn't agree, GOP leadership in the House decided not to vote on immigration at all, on the theory that it was politically safer to do nothing. But for a small group of Republicans, the opposite is true. And this week, they tried to force their leader's hand. A reminder, doing nothing on immigration is a perfectly acceptable situation for a lot of House Republicans. It's an election year, and they don't want to do anything that can even be called making life easier for undocumented immigrants. But there's another group of Republicans, a smaller group, the moderates. Many of them come from Latino heavy districts, and they'd be really happy to cut a deal with Democrats and get this dreamer problem solved. Guys like this guy. Our country has been debating this issue for too long. It's actually an issue that's tearing the country apart. Let's solve it. Carlos Corbello and a couple of dozen House Republicans got together with all the House Democrats and tried to file something called a discharge petition, which effectively forces the House leadership to take votes it doesn't want to take. In this case, they wanted to vote on a bill that would have given dreamers a pathway to citizenship. The discharge petition process is very complicated to execute, but very simple in theory. If a majority of members of the House want to vote on a bill, they get a chance to vote on it. Things were looking good for our plucky band of moderates for a while. But then last night, just before the deadline, they came up two Republicans short of a full discharge. You might call that a loss, but you're not a politician. The very least, we have compelled Republican leaders to unearth this issue, which had been tucked away because it's too complicated, we don't want to deal with this. The, the discharge petition is a means to get to a desirable end. It's not an end in and of itself. So from my perspective, the discharge petition has been a wild success. On the surface, Curbelo is right. House Speaker Paul Ryan has agreed to hold two immigration votes. That's two more than anyone expected the House would hold this year. But about those votes, though, one is on a very conservative bill that's not going to pass. The second is on a compromise bill that doesn't exist yet. Curbelo gave us a sneak peek on what might be in that thing. The solution we have now is a compromise. It's a new visa program that they will be eligible for. They have to apply and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's merit-based. 
but they will all be guaranteed the opportunity to earn one of these visas. Uh, some will have to uh, wait longer than others. If you have a PhD, you're, you're gonna get one of the first ones. So, so that's the way it's designed. The problem here is that Democrats likely won't get excited about a system that treats some dreamers as more valuable than other dreamers. And if you can't get Democrats, you can't get the Senate. And if you can't get the Senate, you can't get a law. But moderate Republicans in the House aren't worried about that right now. They're just happy immigration's back on the agenda. Yes, All of the marshals. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you to stand up and raise your right hand, take an oath before the court for proceedings. Along the southwest border, this is the new normal for public defenders like Richard Gold. Courtrooms filled with defendants charged with improperly entering the United States. Each is, is ready to enter pleas of guilty and proceed to sentencing to their judge. Men and women with chains around their ankles and waists, waiting to be prosecuted. The room is humid as they sit in the very same clothes they were apprehended in. Please be seated. Everyone is under oath the record. I hate seeing people in shackles. I mean, especially uh, somebody with no criminal history, no immigration history, it's hard to look at it. The reason for the increase, Jeff Sessions' zero-tolerance policy. If you cross the border unlawfully, then we will prosecute you. Instead of the catch-and-release approach of prior administrations, where migrants with no criminal history would be returned to their home countries, now those caught at the border are prosecuted and may face up to six months in jail. The shift has dramatically upped the workload for attorneys and jammed criminal courtrooms. In recent weeks, how has your work changed? It's kind of an all-hands-on-deck situation every time. I mean, we, we had been accustomed to handling caseload in the 30s and sometimes in the 40s. And what are you looking at now? Between 70 and 75 in the morning, and then up to another 70 to 75 in the afternoon. Vice News obtained audio from one of these hearings. I'm going to go through individually and ask you how you plead in your case. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Probably guilty. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Guilty. How do you plead? Guilty. How do you plead? Guilty. How do you plead? Guilty. How much time do you have with any individual client? We talk to them on average around five minutes or so. Five minutes before you represent somebody. Give or take. Zero tolerance has had another effect. Under President Obama, under President Clinton, people were getting prosecuted for illegal entry. What is different, though, is that they're separating people from their children. Their children are placed in shelters or foster care indefinitely. What percent of people who come through the courtroom doors that you see would you say have been separated from some kind of family member? The percentages are somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. It's a gigantic proportion. Certainly, I don't remember people routinely saying they've been separated from their children and what's going to happen to my family. According to Customs and Border Patrol, almost 700 children were separated from their parents in just the first two weeks of the policy. Well, I was told when I was separated from my son that you were going to tell me when I was going to be joined with my son again. I don't know who told you that, but you were told it incorrectly. I have no information regarding your child. Immigration doesn't call the court or me personally and tell me what happened to your child. If they did do that, it wouldn't hurt my feelings. I'd be happy to relay the information to you if I could, but they don't do that. So hopefully somebody will get in touch with you through that side of the government. What will happen to families where people are across borders, people who've lost contact because a young child has been taken into federal care? I think this is something that sounded like a real good idea to some people in Washington. 
I understand that they're separating these people from their children as a means of deterring future people from considering the possibility of bringing these kids with them. But the bottom line is, when you've got a child whose life is in danger and you decide to go to a place that you think is safer, I think it's very hard for us to judge them for what they're doing because we're not in their, we're not in their shoes. I want to apologize very much uh, for breaking the laws here. Uh, I don't want to return ever, ever again. But the thing that, uh, that I most desire is to go back uh, with my son, with my child. <clears throat> A humanitarian rescue boat, the Aquarius, carrying more than 600 African migrants, was supposed to land here in Sicily two days ago. But the Italian Coast Guard refused to let it dock, acting on the orders of Italy's new populist government. Today, the Aquarius is making a four-day, 900-mile diversion to Valencia in Spain, after that country's prime minister intervened to avoid what he said was a looming humanitarian catastrophe. Italy's far-right interior minister, Matteo Salvini, declared victory. Penso che non siamo mai stati così centrali e così ascoltati come in queste ore. Non possiamo essere gli unici a fare quello che meritoriamente facciamo nel Mediterraneo sopportandone costi economici e costi sociali. Se l'Europa c'è, batta un colpo adesso o taccia per sempre. Over the course of the campaign season that just ended, Salvini took aim at migrants arriving by boat from Libya. It secured his right-wing Northern League party its place in government. But that line of attack and the party making it never gained much traction here in the South, even though it's on the front line of the migrant arrivals. Salvini's first big move as interior minister shocked the locals here, and it's a sign of the simmering tensions in this deeply divided country. What did you think when you heard that Matteo Salvini had said, I'm sorry, no more ships that are run by NGOs with migrants on can arrive in Italy? I think that this is really alternative to our culture. And I think that uh, the words of Matteo Salvini are completely against the sentiments of Palermitan people, completely against the sentiments of Sicilian people. We say welcome. About 120,000 migrants arrived in Italy in 2017, the highest of any country in Europe. But the numbers arriving have already fallen dramatically. About 11,000 halfway through this year partly as a result of measures already agreed by the European Union. Italy now says that's not enough, and it wants Europe to take much more of the burden. Ugo Ferrello, whose five-star movement is part of the ruling coalition, told us that the Aquarius standoff is as much about sending a message as it is about the new government's pledge to cut immigration. Volta a far comprendere che il problema dell'immigrazione è un problema che deve affrontare tutta l'Unione Europea e, e che può aprire le porte, dovrebbe aprire le porte a una gestione dei flussi migratori in maniera differente. A different ship, holding about a thousand migrants, was allowed to dock today in Catania on the other side of Sicily. The difference being that these migrants were rescued by the Italian Navy. This isn't Italian law. This is an arbitrary set of rules imposed by the leader of a populist anti-immigrant party who now holds high office. On the ground, shock is now turning into confusion. NGOs say to us that if they were to pick up migrants now, they wouldn't know where to take them. If one thing is clear, it's that Europe has to move quickly and adapt to the new reality in this critical country, a hardline populist government whose election promise was as simple as it was ominous, Italy first. Come get in a picture with the Franciscans. Are you sure? Oh yeah, of course. Patrick Carolyn once made it 13 days into a hunger strike. And he says he's been arrested around 15 times, but he seems to have lost track. 
His activism is in service to progressive causes like immigration and prison reform. So today we can say the Franciscans are in the house once again for justice. Causes that matter to him as a devout Franciscan Catholic and executive director of the Franciscan Action Network, a social justice collective made up of more than 50 American churches. Today, he's at a shrine in rural Maryland to talk about one of the Franciscan order's key issues, the environment. Throughout most of Christianity, the dominant social paradigm reflects the theory of human domination over nature. St. Francis proposed a completely different paradigm. How exactly do Franciscans view the environment? We view the environment and planet and all of creation as part of God's creation. So if I go out and destroy creation, I'm destroying God, I'm destroying myself, I'm really harming everything. Leveraging faith for environmental action has opened some well-guarded doors. Earlier in the year, Patrick got a private meeting with EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt. They said, would you be interested in meeting with the administrator? And, you know, I have to be honest, my first thought was, no, why would I want to do this? And then I thought, well, I should. And we had cookies, had coffee. We sat down, we just chatted. We talked about our faith, and we disagreed on, and we do disagree on lots of stuff. We disagree on, you know, first of all, he believes in a theology of dominion over. You mean that he thinks that the planet is, is something that we can harvest from and, and use as, as we please? Yes, I absolutely disagree with him. But we came to agreement on some stuff. He's very committed to water and, you know, looking at lead pipes. Do you think that in some ways it's sort of subversive to be dipping into your faith with the liberal agenda? I'm not really liberal. I'm Franciscan. My agenda is the agenda that St. Francis of Assisi had. There's parts of that that are very liberal. I'm also opposed to abortion. Mm -hmm. And so I can, you know, operate on both sides. Operating on both sides can be a difficult balancing act to pull off in such a partisan environment. But it has happened before. Tonight I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief, a work of mercy beyond all current international efforts to help the people of Africa. The Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, initially allocated an unprecedented $15 billion to fight AIDS in Africa, and is widely believed to have been successful because it had the support of faith groups. Mark Dybul worked at the CDC during the Bush administration and was one of the main architects of PEPFAR. Do you think PEPFAR would have happened, would it have gotten off the ground without the support of Christian groups? There were billion dollar a year increases for several years. We would not have gotten the funding that we received without the engagement of the faith community uh, in the United States because something a lot of people don't understand is the support within, especially within the Republican caucus, comes from social conservatives. It might be really hard for some people to hear that because condoms for so long were, were looked at as something that was horrific. Yeah. It was called the gay disease, yeah. largely by Christian groups. You know, there's no question that there were negative parts of faith engagement in the HIV response and other things. There are no question there are positive responses. You know, we forget policymakers are human beings too. If you're a person of faith, you do connect with a person of faith. You know, I'm openly sure. gay. I connect automatically with people often who are gay, even if I don't have anything else in common with them. You know, hearing from people both that matter to your constituents, but also that matter to you as a person, right. is hugely impactful. Some environmental groups have tried to engage with the EPA under this current administration. Why do you think your message is getting through? I think it's because, you know, I looked at Scott Pruitt as a person, not mm -hmm. as the devil. And I think he probably saw me the same way. And we both agreed that we're people of faith. Hi, I'm Ziggy Marley. We'll be talking about Rebellion Rises. Rebellion Rises. Rebellion Rises. Everywhere I go. Rebellion Rises. They say time changes everything, but we change times. Because we can't wait on time. Because time don't wait on us. So we can't wait on it. We changing the times. Not that we're not waiting on the times to change things. I'm 
I'm always interested in African music and trying to sneak it in. Particularly, I like um, Fela Kuti. I love it and I love what it does to me and I want it to be a part of what I do. When I did start recording this song and the album, the first things I put down to establish the vibe of the song was some of the percussion. So there's a lot of shakery and we use a lot of djembe. Coming from Jamaica, bass is very important to us. It rumble, it grumble, it shake you deep down inside. But it should, it should be very simple. I guess if you ever feel an earthquake, you ever... <laughs> it can be scary sometimes, but in music, it's not here. It's like your body, you know? Well, in the verses of this song, the keyboard is... What is it doing? You see, I play these things and... They just come to me. It's lifting the energy. And then we have a thing we call a rhythm piano, which is bang, bang, bang. That is the hypnotism that's going on on the spiritual level there with that. That's always there for the reggae thing. There is a plucked guitar. That can be seen both as African, but like James Brown, because it kind of are the same kind of thing. I believe there's a spirit within music. And I can feel those vibrations in this album. So this music is that voice, is that leadership, encouragement and involvement in the movement of humanity as a whole and to better this world as we see it today. <laughs> 